Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Business Thinking. Um, I am really delighted that Jeremy Darrock, the Executive Chairman of Sky, is with us. Good morning, Jeremy. Um, good morning, James. Really good of you to do this. Um, the first thing you have to just put up with, I'm afraid, is a toe-curling introduction from me before we get into the conversation, okay. because um, uh, you know the way these things go is that there's there's either a sort of brusque, right, we have to get right into it and, you know, uh, or, or you take the spirit of this thinking, which is we're actually lucky to have you to talk for an hour and we've got time. And the aim of these business thinkings is actually to have time to try and understand some of the choices you make in running as big and influential a business as Sky and some of the issues that are at stake, not just in terms of the business, but society more generally. But um, for people who don't know, uh, Jeremy Darrick is probably one of the most influential business people of my generation, has probably done more to shape not just a company in Sky, but the entire media sector and industry. Um, to give you a sense of it, um, when Jeremy took over as chief exec in 2007, uh, Sky was worth uh, just over 10 billion pounds. It was sold to Comcast uh, just over a decade later for over, valued at over 30 billion pounds, but perhaps more significantly, it had transformed. It had transformed across Europe in terms of scale. It's a business now of, I think, 34, 36,000 people employed by it, but also it had just changed in the way in which it operated and the things that it did, uh, commitments to sea, to the arts, to cycling, these things that just were not part of its uh, cultural DNA, at least when I was a young media reporter covering Sky in the 1990s, it was certainly a much scrappier and more pugnacious uh, business. So Jeremy, I'm really delighted that you're, you're here. The spirit of our thinking, as I say, is it's intended to be, you know, much more like a kind of getting together for breakfast, a, a chance to have a real conversation. Um, the, the thing that we've discovered about Zoom, which is fantastic, is that actually everyone can weigh in. As we're talking, I'll hear and look at what's happening in the chat. My colleague Liz Mosley is managing the chat, so I'll try and make sure that we hear and I at least weave in as many points that, that come up as we're, as we're talking. But I wanted to start, if I could, not with those kind of the, the numbers, because the numbers are just formidable, right, in terms of uh, revenue, employees, market cap, but that culture question about what happened at Sky, whether it was something that sort of crept up on you or something deliberate happened in the way in which the company saw itself and behaved. I think, you know, I remember when I joined Sky, um, and I didn't know a lot about Sky at the, at, uh, at the time, and I was slightly perplexed because I saw this great sort of story and what the business had achieved. And yet it seemed to be um, running out of steam, but, but, but actually almost accepting that it was running out of, of, of steam. And I could never quite square that in my, uh, in my mind. And, and when you got into Sky and, 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 uh, and sort of sensed it, um, there was this sort of sense of, 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 to be honest, a little bit of a lack of ambition, really, in terms of what the business was about and what it could do. And it, it, it was very at odds with everything that it had done. So I think early on it became quite a deliberate thought to say how do we how do we raise that ambition and that manifested itself initially in we set a goal we were at, I don't know seven seven million customers I think we set a goal to get to ten million customers nobody thought we could do it uh, and off we went and, and we did it um, I remember distinctly um, when we launched Sky Arts which was a slightly unusual thing at the time I think for Sky to do. Um, the, the team saying we, we were in a conference room and saying, let's put our best foot forward. Let's, mm -hmm. uh, let's not just do this sort of, you know, equivocally, let's really try and do something for the long, for long haul. And so I think there was, there was that sort of sense of raising an ambition in a broad, in a broad sense um, was, uh, was, was part of it. And then like all of these things, it started to develop and take on um, a little bit of a life of, it, of, it, of itself. Um, you made an interesting point, actually, when you when you said at the start, Sky was a sort of scrappy, pugnacious uh, business. And I, I think that's that's a that's a fair comment at the time, and I think I think it needed to be. I mean, to survive is was 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 pretty hard. Bear in mind, in the early years of Sky, you, you know, a very different sort of interest rate environment versus today. I mean, we, we would. Um, I remember when I when I joined Sky, raising some debt and paying six or seven percent on the on, on the on the debt and thinking I'd done a good deal. 
And, mm-hmm. and of course, today, if you're a startup, you know, loads of problems and challenges, but probably the, the, the cost of, of servicing the business is, is less than it was at the time. So, I, so inevitably, I think the business had, had had the sort of focus on survival, establishment, yeah. and then that first phase of, uh, of, um, of growth. So, so that led, I think, to that sort of feeling about the business. And I kind of was, was, was aware that as you get bigger, that becomes less and less compelling, actually. Um, what what uh, what Jeremy becomes less compelling that 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 culture? Yeah, I've always sort of you know somebody said to me when I joined said you know the the thing about Sky is is uh, the answer is no now what's the question? Um, <laughs> right, and, and of course you know sort of, that's a sort of a kind of funny thing at the time. And when you're small and you and you're fighting to to find your way, that works. But of course we get bigger and more impactful. Not 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 so good, right? And and, and so I was very keen for us to to really start to establish our own ground much more positively mm-hmm. about what we could do as a business mm-hmm. uh, at really at all levels. And, and, and that was very much in our thought. And, and, off, and, off, and, off, and off we went. And, and as I say, it started to take its sort of life of its own really after a while. But, but just, just tell us a bit, about, uh, a bit about that, would you, Jeremy? Because I think, you know, as I said, I mean, I'm, I was covering Sky before you joined. I think you were still at P&G. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think you joined in 2004. Is that right? Yeah, so, sorry, yeah. uh, so I was covering it for But it was really locked in. It was locked in arguments with the BBC. It was locked in, you know, a sort of constant arm wrestle with regulators about, you know, changing, see, seeking to change terms and, if you like, open up the space. But then I look at, you know, the last decade in particular, and you see, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, commitments on oceans, and it's not just Sky Arts, it's, you know, commitments in terms of production and a sense of its own sort of cultural responsibilities. And I wonder whether or not there was something internal happen, whether there were moments sort of sitting inside the building that you thought, okay, we're going to have to change this. Definitely there were. Um, Look, I think... um, it's it's often easy in business to 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 be against something to be for something. Yeah. In a sense, that's a sort of easy place to take. You know, uh, my own view is much of what, for example, the BBC, you know, did does today. It's really got nothing to do with us. Really, we don't really have any dog in that fight. If it impacts the broader media ecosystem, perhaps, and we'll we'll make our views known. But a lot of it is sort of largely pointless. You know, and and it can be quite distracting internally, as well as as as, as externally. I remember we um, uh, early on we um, we were trying to do a, 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 a channel renewal deal with with Virgin, um, and this was when we were just starting on the journey to spend more money in our general entertainment content. Mm. So so we wanted to get a greater return from a channel like Sky One because we wanted to invest more in that, mm-hmm. and we got this gigantic sort of fight where the channel was going to come off air, and it was and uh, and I fronted that up. Actually, I was CFO at the time. But I fronted that up, and I remember going around. It was a sort of you know two day story, but going around um, the various radio stations and talking to reporters, and, and just thinking how pointless this whole thing was. What well, was just a waste of time, really. So, so you know, I wanted to get away from that. You know, I wanted to get away from that, and actually, I wanted personally, you know, to do more positive things. Yeah. You know, I wanted to because uh, it's so much more satisfying to be honest with you. It's so much more fun to to do that than than getting into some argument that's not really doing doing much really. Can, can, I, can I just ask you, I, I touched on P&G and I see Austin Lally is in the chat, uh, who I think was also um, a P&G in his time. I, I don't know whether, Austin, you're there, but it's whether we're worth asking this point to, to you, Jeremy, about how much that culture, you hear it from Unilever people, you know, Katie, my co-founder, is making the same point. You hear this from Unilever people, you hear this from P&G people too, that it does have quite a formative impact. Austin, are you there? If not, let's let, let, let's. Let. You there, Austin? Yeah, James. Hi there. Hi, Jim. Hi there. Jeremy. Long time. A long time, Austin. Yeah, it's nice to uh, nice to uh, hear from you again. No, it's great. Very good. Yeah, well, actually, I think you've put the question very well. Which was, you know, I think back in that time, P and G was a bit of an academy company. So, what would you think you you took from those experiences that you took, you know, to to Sky later? I, two or three things. I mean, funny enough, the, the further on I've gone in my career, and uh, I go more back more to those learnings in PNG, because there was a sort of simplicity about what PNG was seeking to do. Um, the the you know the importance of brand, the importance of people, 
uh, the importance of doing the right thing. These are all things that we didn't probably didn't appreciate as much at the time, but were just literally drilled into us and actually are a pretty good roadmap for for business. Uh, and then and then I think we were all lucky, you know, at times there was a cohort of us at, at P&G, Austin was there. I can think of Robin Marshall, you know, Gavin Patterson, uh, Phil Jansen, on the list goes, of just very, very talented people. So, so you were in an environment where you were developing, pushing each other, learning from each other um, at a really accelerated rate. And, 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 that, and, and you know, the big learning out of that, of course, was, was, the, was the power of organization and culture. You know, and, and, and P&G, I think at the time, I would have described it as, as a fantastic high performance culture. And, um, and much of that today, I go back to actually, often my mind, if I've, if I've got a, a tricky problem, or something I'm not sure about, very often I'll drift back to those principles and think about them. Uh, it's amazing actually how, how you realize the indelible impression a leader can have on you at a very early age and how that can carry you through your career for many, many years. And did you, and did you, Jeremy, did you think that, th thank you, Austin, I'm intrigued just also about thinking about those people. I mean, it's quite interesting, that, that list. I hadn't thought about it. Liz was just mentioning in the chat how many people seem to have come from P&G. And we've, you know, held thinkings with Philip Jansen, with Gavin Patterson. You know, these are people running, you know, a fair, fair chunk of Britain's biggest businesses. Mm. How much, as well as being kind of cultural leadership, is there a... Uh, an, an ethos or an understanding of customers that's different from, let's say, engineering or manufacturing or financial services businesses. Do you think those fast-moving consumer goods companies were, were, were organisationally better or culturally better at understanding customers? Uh, very much so, and I think I think um, I'd actually add to that and say what. What P and G was was brilliant at was was understanding consumers and customers, and I'll, I'll draw a distinction there, uh, which I think many businesses don't sometimes don't quite appreciate. So, you know, think of a consumer as as your end user, you know, a Sky household, for example, hmm. uh, and really understanding, um, you know, what was the you know, we talk about, you know, uh, habits, usage, attitudes, really understanding in the home what was happening with consumer behaviours. How people's attitudes were changing because that would inform you know their habits in the future and then of course our customers would be the likes of tesco and sainsbury's and and, and we needed to understand the, the, uh, the, those companies as well we need to understand their motivations and how do we you know how do we work and partner with them in a way that got the outcomes that we wanted mm -hmm. so that became just a just a way of working i mean i, I can tell you what is the consumer benefit was a phrase that I, I suspect was probably the most used phrase in PNG at mm. almost every level. You would start with what is the consumer benefit? Mm. You know, and it's and it's a very, very simple way to think about a product or a service or a change you're making and to frame it and say, is is this helping either the ultimately the people who pay our bills? Is this helping somebody who pays subscription to Sky every month? Uh, and and if not, why are we doing it, frankly? <laughs> or if we don't know what the benefit is, let's go away and really figure that out. And so and so, when you think now, I mean, I was looking back. There's a really handy thing on the website, Jeremy, which is just traces the sky history, right? Yeah. And it just it go, you know, it's an unbelievable mushrooming of businesses. H how do you organise in your own mind the logic of what sky? has become you know from a you know from 1990 you know buying up sports rights and then movies and then th there was a sort of simple logic to it to something that now has so many different kind of expressions and I don't mean geographically I mean just here in the UK hmm. well I, th I think you know you sort of s start with a, a sense of the breadth of of of, um, of the markets that we compete in today uh, and and you know when you define the sort of broader at the time TV or household kind of video market. And then you can add very quickly services like, you know, broadband and mobile phone. The, yeah. these, these are services that sit very, very well. So you can sort of have a, a an end view of, of, of the areas that you've got experience in, you've got legitimacy and you've got some success in. Yeah. And then always, um, uh, uh, I, I always used to try to define them as, as wide as I, I, I could. I worked many years ago with, with a, uh, a colleague and he worked for, um, he told the story about Gatorade. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't even know who, who owns Gatorade. But anyway, they, Gatorade had 97% of the sports drinks market at the time. 
And he said they were totally captured. I mean, how do you grow that when you've got a 97% share of a, of a, of a market? And he, and he tells the story of his, uh, of his boss who comes in and his boss, you know, only, only made one change, which is he included bottled water in their market size. And they went from a 97% share to a 3% share overnight. <laughs> and, and the sort of story is the guy said, well, do you think you can grow that? You know, off you go. Yeah. So, so I used to try, I always try to think of those as wide as we can, because that, that creates a much, much broader playing field that we can think about. And then I think alongside that, you know, you, you, then, you then look at, at the business. And I, I try to think of the business as, as sort of pools of assets, uh, as opposed to pools of costs. Um, so you can, if you think of our, um, our engineer workforce, which is a, a connected workforce that sits right, right across the country, um, you know, that's an incredible asset. Uh, mm-hmm. It's something that we're you know, very good at. And so when you, when you think of those two things, you start to find connections and places that you can expand into that are valuable, uh, where you both have the capabilities, uh, but I think also some of the legitimacy, legitimacy to, be, to be successful. And then that ultimately manifests itself in different businesses and different revenue streams, and off you go. And, and, what's, the, and just, what's the flip to the question you had? I mean, I love that, you know, the answer is no, what's the question? The, the risk, presumably, as you get bigger and bigger, is that to an extent Sky can do anything. You know, you could put on, you know, a live concert business uh, if you wanted to, but you could also do, I imagine, you know, Sky Finance off the back of, you know, your... I mean, someone must be coming to you all the time, Jeremy, saying, hey, why don't we give this a go? So on, on what basis do you start saying no to things? So I think, I think you, you know, you go through that process of why is it, you know, why is this opportunity something that we are going to be able to be successful in for the long term? Mm-hmm. You know, there are many things we can do for the short term and we can and we can be successful but really why we're going to be successful here for the, the long term mm-hmm. i think there's inevitably um a balance of just opportunity and bandwidth you know whereas whereas the, the 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 obvious easy thing to do and how do we pursue that and keep getting better at that mm-hmm. without getting too distracted um so it's a sort of balance of those things you know always a, a kind of mixture of strategy i think and judgment in in, in terms of, of doing that what worst guy is at its best is when it commits you know when it gets an idea and the organization gets behind it and then it really commits mm-hmm. what we're not so good at is doing sort of small incremental things often the organization loses interest a bit of patience with it mm-hmm. uh, and it drifts away so when you do place a bet i've learned you know you've got to place a big bet and you've really right. got to sort of push push hard so you can think of a What's a good example? Something like the high definition market. I mean, we take high definition television now as an absolute standard. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, you know, in, early, in the early sort of 2006, seven, that wasn't the case. And actually the broadcast standards that existed in Europe mm-hmm. uh, were much better than those in the US. So the jump to high definition in theory was, mm-hmm. much, was much smaller, mm-hmm. but we were convinced that was a big idea, mm-hmm. but we knew that, that, that we had to move the industry. It wasn't just going to be moving sky. So we actually much of what we did was to invest in outside broadcast companies to re-equip them, you know, to 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 incentivize channel providers to switch their signal to high definition, knowing that that would benefit many people, but actually ultimately would create the market shift that we wanted to uh, to achieve. Uh, that requires that requires you to go all in. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't just equivocate. In fact, in the early years, we we had, we we had a the situation where we had five or six channels in high definition, and we were just drifting. And it was it was the decision to say we're not going to have five or six, we're going to have seventy. Now, what does it take us to get seventy? And then suddenly the whole thing starts starts to move. So I think it's a it's a mixture of all the things that we sort of talk about. It's a sense of judgment. It's a it's a it's analysis. It's 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 it's, it's kind of strategy. It's all of that sort of stuff. But, but, but more than anything, at the end of it, it's a belief, right? Yeah. That's, that we're really going to go for this now. And then you commit the whole organization to it and off we, off we go. Right. So that's interesting. So, so often the ideas that don't make are ones that may be good ideas, but are not, are not big enough or game changing enough to be right. worth the time and energy. Can, can, I, can I sort of just have a change of pace, if you, if you like? What, one of the thing, reasons I think that I was so keen to hear from you was to, to talk about. The, the culture of business and business's responsibility more broadly in society, Jeremy. And, and it sort of makes me laugh a little bit because I kind of think back, you know, 15 years ago and the idea that, you know, you know, we would be sitting talking about, 
you know, Sky's role in the climate change debate, it's like, yeah, that's great. Sky News is going to cover it and it's going to be. But actually, I was looking back, Sky, I think, made its first carbon neutral commitments about 15 years ago. So it's been in this argument a long, long time. The, the, the question for me really is, is what works? What, what's the, what can businesses do that actually make a difference? And, and what do businesses do that are, that are greenwashed, that are kind of acts of dressing up? Well, if you, if you talk, if you go externally, you talk to um, to just ordinary people, um, and this has been true for a long, a long time. They will, they will typically say to you, "We want businesses to do. We'd like to see big businesses to do three things. We want them to do more for young people. Uh, we want them to do more for the environment, uh, and we want them to do more together. We're tired of, of businesses only acting in their own interest." It's it you know it appears false. We don't really believe it. So I actually want to see businesses acting in in, in concert in some of these areas. And, and 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 over the last ten years ten years or so, that hasn't really changed uh, a lot actually. Um, and it all makes sense to me if you think of, if you think about it. I mean, we saw it in you know in the Brexit vote. You know how many how many people said you know I've sort of slightly given up on my my life. This is this is this I'm I'm. I'm I'm voting to exit for my kids. I mean, that was if you went to Sunderland and Newcastle, that would palpably be what you'd have you'd have you'd have read. And I think we know that the environment will manifest itself in the next generation more than our generation. So um, I think you have to you have to, or my sense was you have to you know, think about the the the, the, you know, the 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 big vectors that are continuing across society and, and place our efforts there. And that's why we've done so much with young people. Um, and that's why we've chosen uh, to, to, right from the get-go, have an early position on the, on the environment. Um, I think there's a big personal motivation to it, and I think that's important. Um, the, the team that came together at to Sky in the early 2000s um, were all of a similar age. We all had young kids, uh, and we all had this, um, this sense of, you know, when, when, when your kids say to you, when you had a chance to do something, what did you do? How are you going to answer that question? And, and I think that was really that was really quite important because I think unless you've got the personal commitment to do it throughout the team, it's not really going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think too often greenwash or corporate CSR wash is, is too narrowly held in the business. And there's not there's not enough broad scale buy into it across the across the senior team. Mm -hmm. And there, and therefore it, it becomes too marginal, not that not that important. So. You know, you want to you want to try and I think impact the you know the big questions in life, the big questions that you think you've got relevancy to, and 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 do your bit to do those, and then you need to get I think uh, a real personal buy-in at the top if it's going to last and you're going to and you're going to make it happen. If you don't have those two things, probably it's going to be a bit marginal, uh, and probably it's going to wither on the vine. And, and Jeremy, I see my colleague at Tortoise, Ed, Ed Davidson, has asked this question about how much ESG, how much environmental, social and governance metrics actually have had an impact on Sky or whether they felt a little bit after the fact for you? No, I think they've been, I mean, they are, if I'm answering the question the right way, they are, they are central to, 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 to what we do. So, you know, if we, um, you know, we're building a big studio facility up in Elstree. You know, they they are built in right at the very heart, uh, uh, at the heart of that. If I think of, you know, what we're doing up in, upstream in product development, um, you know, reducing our uh, our carbon footprint, reducing the energy consumption of a box, all of that sort of stuff is built in right at the design, uh, right at the design phase and carried and carried through. So. They, 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 they've, they've got to be central to the, to the, you know, to the mission of the, uh, of the business. And I think, you know, look, why, why most, if you're most business plans, they'll, they'll often be, be, you know, they'll have a lot of financial metrics in there, of course, but, but, but why just that? I mean, who said that's, that's the only narrow set of things that we should focus on? Why don't we decide a, a broader set of metrics and build those, build those things into and, can I, and Jeremy, can I just ask about that? Because one of the one of the questions that you hear more and more is about the is about the metrics themselves. I, when you report your financial results, mm. you know we're pretty confident. We find them sometimes hard to understand, but mm. we're pretty confident that you're operating to the same set of rules as your competitors and trying to make it work. When we look at the ESG numbers, 
we, we're much more skeptical still, aren't we? That exactly how those metrics work and w whether or not you can effectively game them to, you know, improve the image of, of your company or any other company. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, you know, having been this world and especially having come out, come into the CEO role from the, from the finance director's role, whether or not you think there's a way that all big businesses could be operating to the same metrics on social and environmental outcomes, as well as on financial results. I think the, 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 the whole financial reporting system, and, and goodness knows that's had its problems as well, you know, has, has matured and taken time to get to where it, uh, where it is. I think the process of, 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 of audit and scrutiny is really, really important. And I, it seems to me that you can extend that um, quite easily into environmental reporting um, and have sort of certification and sign off and transparency around that. And that's a good place to start. Eventually, you know, do you ever do you get to a, a system where you've got some of the same standards that, are, that apply across industries and companies in the way that financial standards do? I mean, I think that's a long that's a that's a long journey to follow. Certainly, we should be going down that that, that direction um, because you know, as we know, one of the things that really undermines confidence in people is when people game the system. You know, they're not they're not they're not open. They're not transparent. Um, they seek to overclaim. That's that's a that's a real that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. so, 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 just can we just hone in on COP twenty six and climate for a moment? My co-founder Katie, I'm going to bring Katie in a moment, has just sort of made a point about the number of companies, the school of um, uh, the Blavatnik School of Government Data, about the number of companies that are actually making um, uh, net zero commitments and just how low they are and and just whether or not your impression is that we're slightly getting carried away by the rhetoric around COP26 and sort of corporate enthusiasm to be seen to be doing things but mm. when you scratch a little closer we're a long long way from making the commitments that are needed what's your read on that I think it's um Look, I think it's sort of a bit, of, a bit of both, right? Almost inevitably, um, that that happens. That may not be a bad thing, if if it manifests itself then in action in those companies. I mean, the worst situation is that we make a whole set of commitments for COP twenty six. You know, we want to have those kind of classic elite gatherings where everybody talks about something and then nothing, nothing comes yeah. out. Of it. I mean, that that's terrible if that's the case. Having said that. Uh, if it becomes a call to action, it becomes a prompt for, for more companies to do more, then that, that, that has got to be a good, a good thing. I mean, it seems to me we've taken a decision as a country that we want to be a decarbonized economy by 2050, and we all have a role to play. <laughs> and every big company has got a role to play. And my view is not, not actually to say uh, I, sh I should be part of that or not. If, if we've taken that decision as a, as, a, as a country, then we should be, right? We have to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for every big company, how we define big in the UK, mm -hmm. they should be setting their own their own plan and clear goals. Uh, and COP should just be part of that that journey around it. And if they want to be part of that and get some credit for that, good on them. You know, can I, can I, I, Katie, do you do you want to weigh in on this? I'm I'm just interested because you're the one who pointed out the numbers here. Morning, Jeremy. Nice to see you. Morning, Katie. Um, Actually, I, it was in the Times this morning. I read that only f it was four hundred and seventeen of the of the world's biggest two thousand businesses had made that commitment. So I agree with you. It's businesses' responsibility to get on that front foot and to to do those things. I actually want to say something completely different to you. You, I, I, um, I blame you for the fact that my husband now wears lycra every weekend, <laughs> and the fact and the fact okay. that guy backed cycling and made it cool for the middle-aged man to put the lycra on jeremy terrible terrible moment um but but the thing that i think is interesting there when we talk about net zero and climate is actually the the consumer behavior change mm. so when you think about the commitments you're making to net zero and you know you're doing it as a business I kind of want to know what you think Sky's role is when you go back to this consumer behavior piece, because business, government, everyone's got a role to play. But also, you know, every time we have conversations around net zero, it, it, it comes back to us as consumers mm. and things mm. and choices we make. So if you can get my husband to wear Lycra. Sure. Can I get what, him to do more you, the environment? Yeah. What, what, what do you see Sky's role being around consumer behavior change? Well, look, I, I think... 
And look, I think generally business, if you think about businesses, any consumer business, you know, we've got a, a huge network and connection with, uh, with, 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 with customers and, 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 and a great capability and ability to activate. You know, that's what businesses are you know, generally very, very good at. And I think sometimes we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't value enough the, the ability of businesses to connect outcomes to individuals in a way that can drive that can drive real change. So if you take the cycling example, we got into cycling because I wanted to for two reasons. Really, one, uh, I wanted to do something for the London Olympics. Um, we, we couldn't, we didn't have any broadcast coverage, and, and and so, you know, this was a big event for the nation. So supporting the cycling team and then on everything that flowed from that was um, uh, was 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 part of that. And then I wanted to find a smaller sport because Sky had been associated with big sports often and say, how can we go in and contribute positively and fund a smaller sport for a better outcome? And the outcome is, is more people cycling regularly for fun and fitness. I mean, that was, that was, that was it. And so once you frame it that way, you know, it was a, it, it, we, we framed it actually in, in, in quite clear sort of business terms, really, if you see, if, if, if you see what I mean, and everything flowed from, uh, from uh, from that, it shows. I think the power of a of a consumer business, a business like Sky, to drive that change. Now, when you take Sky, um, uh, it's almost amplified um, because, of course, we've got this big voice. Right, we're a big broadcast network. We're a big media company. You know, we get to you know sixty percent of Britain. I mean, we can get to all of Britain with our free to air channels regularly, all the time. So we can use that voice. Uh, in a very, very powerful way. That's that's one of the great strengths of Sky News. You know, it can reach so many different people. And, and, and because we've got so many different channels, we've got lots of time, we can we can really take the time to um, to get things to pop and to explain them. Um, and we know that that can drive uh, real behavior change. So in many respects, we're trying to do the same, uh, the same thing with the work we, we do on, on, on climate. Uh, in cycling, we came up with this this catchphrase, which uh, which which we use, which is from, from inspiration to participation, uh, and and we learned that you need you, you really need to have both of those things. You need to find a big inspiration that people can buy into, uh, whether that's about creating the first British team to win the Tour de France, whether it's about Olympic medals, whether it's about you know uh, you, you know men like me getting fitter, whatever those things are. <laughs> Uh, and then you can drive participation from that, but you need both of them really. If you don't, if you don't have that that sense of inspiration, very very hard to drive participation. And 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 so if you translate that to the environment, I think one of the problems with the environment generally is everything's so negative. It's quite hard to feel up about that. So if we can find ways and stories to 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 make it feel more positive, to 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 make this sense that we can change things. We can improve things, and I can be part of that journey. That I think is a very uh, powerful. Uh, that's a very sort of powerful motivation. Not an easy thing to do, but an important thing to try and achieve. I think. And, and, and what I mean, I see. I see, Jeremy. That um, Anil Patel has asked this question about the Sky's daily climate change program. Yeah. So, so what's the th what's the thinking there? So um, run up, in the run-up to COP, we, we you know we Sky News climate has been a big part of what Sky News have chosen to to, to do, and they've really been at the forefront um, from an editorial point of view in terms of a lot of a, a lot of the work that we've uh, done, and actually the all the work we did on the oceans mm -hmm. and single-use plastic actually came out of Sky News because they saw that as a big news story that they wanted to pursue as part of their overall. Uh, climate program. So they are thinking as a news organization about the journey to COP. They've, they've got a passionate belief that the environment is going to be one of the big um, uh, news uh, verticals, if you like, over the next the next decade. They, they believe, I think, that this is you know, the 10 years that change is required. And that much of, of the news reporting will do you can connect back to to change in the environment. I and mean, we know that in terms of people movement, we can know that in terms of you know economic change. That, you know, we know that in terms of weather, which is always a huge news story. So, so for them, the run of the COP is a perfect way for them to really get behind the work they're doing on the environment. Mm. The, the annual, the, the daily show is is a great way to focus that. They've got the bandwidth and time to be able to do it. We've got the capability to be able to do it. 
So, so that's really where it's, it's, it's come from. But that's a good example because um, uh, you know, they did that off their own bat. I mean, I learned about it a while ago and they said, we want to do this, we're going to do it. They, uh, they're editorially independent. Mm -hmm. But it is a good example, actually, I think, of how a lot of the work we've done is now just imbued right across the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and each part of the business is free to interpret it and develop it as they, as they want to. So, Jeremy, I'd like to I'd like to spend the ne ne next little section we can then just thinking about how expectations of Sky have changed. Because I understand your point about how culture changed, how you went from the sort of no to the yes, and then engaging some of these issues. But now, as it's grown, what's expected of Sky and some of the answers it's expected to provide have changed. And I, I thought I might just come if I might to Tom Kenrick because Tom had asked a couple of uh, questions. One was about business in the community, i.e., you know, what, what Sky does locally and how it's party to that, those, the, those, those big issues, but also around who's on air on Sky, how, how Sky can change the, um, the, the dynamic around, uh, you know, uh, black and Asian and minority ethnic actors and the mix of actors who are on our, our, our screen, to not just actors, presenters and, mm. and reporters too. Um, Tom, are you there? There you are. Uh, I can see there's you. There's a different Tom here. Just asked to unmute. Sorry, Tom, Tom Levitt, I'm going to come to you in a moment if I might. But there's yeah, Tom okay. with an H who's there. I can see you. And there's Tom Levitt without an H. Tom Kenrick, can you want? Yes, you're there, but you can't seem to be. Let me just, I'm trying to unmute you. I you, were in, you, you were, were in control. control. That was what was going on. <laughs> well, you know, these brief moments of control should be celebrated, Tom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, morning, Jeremy. Um, so yes, obviously, you, as, as chair of business community, I think one of the things, um, so I work for NatWest Group and we're members. Um, uh, and um, one of the things that really struck me when you took over as chair is that Sky seemed to be there and you seemed to be there because you were trying to lead by example rather than because you'd bought your way into the, into the chairmanship that some of the previous chairs or, or lead companies around BITC just seemed to be sponsoring more than anyone else. Um, and so uh, it's really been great for these last five years or so to see a company leading by example and the rest of us kind of chasing after you. So that was my comment about the stretch. Um, the, the other question, which is kind of more forward looking, I read The Good Immigrant recently. And what really struck me was the number of uh, media personalities, uh, media people, um, people of colour uh, in that book who were saying how few roles there were um, and what roles were available were stereotyping. Um, and the, the classic example, which is not Sky, was, it was the one that really hit me was a comment about EastEnders and who has had the most doof doof moments in EastEnders uh, in the last 40 years. And no person of color has ever had a doof doof moment. Um, and it's meant to represent a postcode in, in London, which is something like a third or 40% BAME. Um, and, and that really struck me as an amazing stat. Mm. And I just wondered what, what you as a media producer thought about, well, not thought about that, but, but what are we trying to do to change that in the future? So I think, uh, look, we can, and, and, and I think there's a huge responsibility across all of the broadcast media to do a lot more. Um, and uh, we've, um, I mean, I'm pleased with the progress we're making, particularly the progress we're making on screen. I think we did, we, our first journey around diversity had focused initially a lot on, uh, on women and bringing more uh, females through the organization, females on screen. Um, now it's much more around um, ethnic diversity and, and broadening uh, that, that out. Uh, and we're making you know, really good progress there. But it's, it's one of the things I've learned when you want to change that is, um, you, you know, if, if you're not very active, the status quo always wins. I mean, that's why it's the status quo. <laughs> so you've really got to, you know, you know, be very, um, you've got to hunt very hard, you know, to find people, to give them the opportunity, frankly, to respect them, to respect their views and respect their difference, respect what they bring that you don't have. And think about what are the systems uh, that you can put in place uh, to really, uh, to really em embrace that. And I think, you know, you often get into conversations, I hear a lot about this idea of, uh, you know, um, uh, reduction of standards. Somehow, if we're going to do it, we're going to take our standards. I'm sort of, sort of slightly insulting to people, really, to hear that. 
And the answer, you've got, to, you've got to demand that we have the change and say, go and find me, you know, the talented people who exist, the people of colour who are, who are very, very talented at any, any uh, minority group to bring that about. My experience is when you do that, there are so many talented people and there are so many pools of talent that businesses are not fishing in. It's, uh, it's such a shame, you know, it's, it's, uh, and actually when you start to do that, you know, there's a real competitive advantage you can tap into because not enough businesses are, uh, uh, are doing that. And I, and I suppose it's a little bit, to get back to your point on BITC, you know, that is BITC is a wonderful um, business network, the oldest business network, I think, in the, in, in, in the world. When I got the chance to chair that, you know, similarly, I just I didn't just want to sit and sort of chair it. I wanted to really try and help it. You know, how do how do you how do you how do you help it? One of the great things about Sky now is we can either be we can either we can choose to be one of two things. We can either be a drag weight to change, or we can be a rocket ship on the back of change. Right? Both of those things we can decide to do. If we can think of ourselves as saying we can be a rocket ship, we can find these things that are important to us and commit to them and use our voice and, our voice and the power of a network, we know we can change things, right? Mm -hmm. If we're not, if we're equivocal and, and we resist it, you know, then we'll just, we'll just, we'll just be a drag weight. And I think you've, businesses, all business, I feel very passionate about this, have got to be, you've got to be a rocket ship, right? Decide what you do and, you know, really help these smaller charities, causes, minority groups um, to um, to progress more. So it's uh, it's an exciting time actually because you know when I know the energy in the business, I, I know the targets we've set ourselves, and if we can get remotely close to that, you know we're going to have a big effect. I think so. I'm, I'm very, I feel very up about it. Jeremy, just on that, what are you what are you doing, or what does Sky do on these questions about? Uh, you know, mandatory ethnicity pay gap reporting, um, issues around broad, more broadly the, you know, the Parker Review, um, you know, executive XCO plus one representation. How, how does Sky approach those issues? Well, we, you know, we, <clears throat> we embrace them all. I mean, I think things like, <clears throat> excuse me, all the work that's been done on pay gap and pay reporting from what I can see has been universally positive because it's, you know, it's focused businesses to externally report and account for, for what their numbers is. And frankly, I suspect in many, including us, to understand more in a level of detail that we previously didn't engage in. So I think all and of that you, is- And sorry, sorry, forgive me for yeah. you, you, so, so Sky does, obviously does the mandatory gender pay gap reporting. Do you also do the ethnicity pay gap reporting? We're doing the ethnicity uh, pay gap uh, reporting as well as part, as, as, as part of that. Yeah, okay. And then, you know, for us, you know, the, we want to use that to develop the insights internally, you know, more fully that we can then that we can then exploit. The one thing I think you've got to be slightly careful about is I think the more and more you 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 you, you must never let ownership you know seed to the outside. Mm -hmm. Ownership has to stay within. So so we have to own what we want to do, uh, uh, you know, and set our own course. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, based upon what we want to do, and then be able to explain that and defend it, and, and, and articulate why we're doing what we're, we're we're doing. That's the only caveat I would bring to that. And sometimes, if you if you if you're only responding to external stuff, you know you can you can lose ownership if you're not careful. Okay, Jeremy, thanks. There, there, there are two questions: one from Tom Levitt and one from Tess Murray, both around. You, you know, these metrics and and it cuts to your ownership point, i.e. who's making decisions. I'm going to come to Tom first and then Tess, and I'll come back to you, Jeremy, if I might. Tom. Thank you. Um, I start off as a, a resident of Brentford, so I see the sky windmill as a, a, an icon on my horizon most mornings. Um, but I've also been impressed, James, by the Tortoise Responsible 100 Index, because uh, we've been talking about uh, rankings, but this index, allows you allows the consumer the user to choose whether they're going to focus on environmental matters whether it's going to be on, on modern slavery on human rights matters uh, or or indeed on, on on governance issues so yes there are a lot of ways of uh, of grading and ranking emerging um, they mostly seem to focus around the sustainable development goals but let's not wait for the very best to to emerge is it 
possible that uh, we can just use some, anything that, that relates to the sustainable development goals as a metric and use it for ways to, to promote responsible business on all fronts. Well, thank you. Before Jeremy, before you answer, I'm just going to ask Tess, because she's got a question really about the, you know, financial performance versus ESG performance. Tess, are you there? Yeah. Morning. Morning. Um, well, you just asked it, really, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, morning, Jeremy. I was just, I'm just curious to know, um, I mean, obviously, Sky's ambitions are amazing. And I'm just, I'm curious to know where the tension between investors, shareholders and the company ever arise. So I've always got the sort of vision about everyone's non-financial KPIs are, are fantastic and hugely admirable, but I'd just love to be in the room with your top institutional shareholders who say, yeah, we've knocked the park out on climate, but I'm afraid we've completely missed total shareholder return. <laughs> and they get, that's great, that's great. <laughs> I just can't ever imagine a situation where that happens. Um, so I'm kind of curious to know if you bump up against the sort of traditional expectations from investors and that that feels like something that needs to change or if it's actually changed already and you're really taking people along for the journey and time horizons for investing have changed, return expectations have changed. Um, so what's it like at the sharp end with investors? So I think you did take the second question first. I, I mean, I mean, it seems to me the, 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 the first thing to say, people often say to me, you know, how do I develop a sort of sustainable business strategy? And I always say to them, the first thing, if you want to be a sustainable business, you need a good business strategy. Because <laughs> if you're out of business, you're not going to change anything. So actually don't see it in sort of conflict. See, see, that's the first thing you've got, you've got to do. And I think you're right. You'll win shareholders, my hearts and minds. I mean, certainly win their minds, you know, based upon the strength of the, of the business. And, 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 you know, one of the things that um, I feel kind of proud about in, in the journey over the last 12, 13, 14 years is, you know, we, our financial performance has been very strong. We've grown essentially our revenues, our earnings, our customer base by, on average, 10% a year over that time in, in what most people, I think, would recognize as a pretty disruptive environment. So, so that, I think, gives you the legitimacy to then start to talk to people about a wider uh, about a kind of wider purview. One of the things that um, always sort of surprises me, if you think if you think of the value of a business, so a value of a business to an investor, is just the future tail of its cash flows uh, in, in, in simple terms. How rarely I would have a conversation with, with, with investors about what really is the terminal value of Sky. Ultimately, what is that? Because, you know, you can, all, all the conversations would be about short-term growth, typically. And very few of them about well actually what what's what's the what's the what's the length of the tail and you can create a lot of value by extending by extending the length of the tail and I think that speaks to fundamentally all of the things you do that make the business more durable uh, and more sustainable. Mm -hmm. Having said that, my experience is when you introduce that with shareholders, when you talk to them about it, they were very very open minded. Um, so I think it was less than, than it was something they rejected. I just think it probably wasn't something that was particularly in people's minds or they thought a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really get any pushback at all on ever really from a shareholder on um, you know, any of the work that we did. Now, as I say, that is set against the context you know, of pretty strong financial performance. So we never really faced a sort of significant financial uh, downturn. My, my sense is that the, the, the capital markets are changing. I mean, I hear more and more of, of, of shareholders and investors want to talk about sustainability. Certainly, I would think in terms of the, the capital that's, that's seeking to come into the market. So much of it today is focused on the broad area, sort of sustainable investments and what, what, is, what does that mean? But I, I suspect the broader capital markets will be followers rather than leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the leadership in this area is, is going to have to come, I think, from different places, from governments, from companies, um, and shareholders will 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 um, will follow that. Um, and then, Tom, to your point on sustainable goals, I mean, yes, you know, we 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 um, uh, we think a lot about the sort of UN sustainable goals. And again, you know, you know, when 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 I think <clears throat> as a company, I think when when you know whether you know kind of low, low, um, national governments or sort of global institutions come together and, to say, and set priorities and say these are the priorities 
you know, it's incumbent upon us to get behind them. Now, we can't get behind all of them all the time. I don't think we should be rewriting different things. I think we exist in a framework uh, and an ecosystem that we have to, that we're part of. And so, um, and so we, we, we think about those as a, as a general sort of guide to the, uh, to the activity uh, we do. Um, and I'd, I'd make one other point, which is, I think businesses often are very good at, talk, at talking about what they contribute. You know, the, 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 the tax revenues we generate, um, the, 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 the jobs we create, all of that's great. I, but I think I'd like to hear more tacit recognition from business about the, re, the free resources that they access. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 you know, the roads, the air quality, the healthcare systems. I mean, these are all things that we get essentially for, for free. And so we are consumers of resource ourselves that's provided to us by national infrastructure, essentially for, for, for not quite, but essentially for, for free, at least free at the margin. And so we, we, we have a duty to replenish that. Mm -hmm. And when society says this is how we want to replenish and take care of these things, I think we've got a, a, a sort of incumbent responsibility to react to that and to do our bit. And, you know, if every business just figured that out and did its bit, you know, we, we'd be in a lot better place, I think. Jeremy, thanks. Mm -hmm. And Tessa and, and Tom, thank you. Thank you, too. In the last few minutes, Jeremy, I wanted to talk about the, the, the decade to come. And, it, and in particular, not, not about responsibility as regards you know climate or society generally but about the issues of accountability and accessibility right so you know when I was growing up television at the time was certainly commercial television was divided into regional areas you know it was you know Thames Television or Granada TV. There was TV itself was rooted in a place, and in the you know the advent of Sky, created a new commercial operator that 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 operated nationally. Right, it obviously grew, it became international, and then with the advent of streamers, you've now got a world in which so much of our culture is produced by global operators mm -hmm. who are headquartered internationally, and of course, the Comcast mm -hmm. deal makes that the case too for mm -hmm. Sky. And I just wondered what you think that means about the kind of culture that is produced for our screens, what, what changes and what will continue to change, and what happens if I, as a consumer of that culture, have a problem with it? What's the nature of the accountability of my broadcasters mm. or my streamers or my providers of entertainment and information? How will that change in the 2020s and how do you think we should address it? So I think two, I'd say a few, a few things of that. I mean, I do, I do think in, if I think of the sort of broader media sector, you know, we are heading where, down a pathway where we're probably going to see a, a number of large global media, um, let's say conglomerates, that's probably not the right word, large, just large global media companies, mm -hmm. uh, probably a handful of those that are see, seeking to compete globally uh, and are sort of reinvented models and, and are across across the world. And they're going to be able to do that, I think, because many of the previous you know barriers uh, have, have really just tumbled down. And certainly enabled by you know IP and streaming and broadband build out and all of these things, mobile build out, all of these things is going to make it easier. So I think we will see that, uh, and I think probably we'll see some a more homogeneous uh, uh, homogeneous content that's coming that's coming from that i mean it seems to me if you look broadly if i think of sky's content base it, it, i would say it sort of fits into three buckets we're, we're, we're typically sort of searching the world for the best content globally and on the whole most of that is coming out of the us mm -hmm. so you can think of our relationships with the hollywood studios or with netflix or and 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 that's you know, it's, it, it's 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 at the moment translating right across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, you can you can think we can think of something like uh, uh, either the Crown would be a good example of mm -hmm. something which appears to have gone right across the world. And, and I think it's interesting when I hear the BBC talk a little bit about you know their success in the US. How you can see some of that as well. So probably English language, I suspect, is going to dominate all of that. You've then got um, in most markets really quite local content. Um, in Europe, that's typically, you know, the, the commercial free-to-air players uh, on, uh, on the whole, typically being, being quite general in their nature, um, typically chasing advertising, uh, uh, advertising dollars, 
uh, or pounds. And, and so, you know, that I think will continue to be there. I think it'll be important, probably, probably under, under, under more pressure, I suspect, as the advertising markets change. And then I think in between, there's a, there's a big space for different sorts of content that, that, is, that is neither of those two things. And that's really the space that Sky's investing in and, 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 and playing in. So that could be um, entertainment, drama, comedy, the arts, actually sport. But, but where it's produced um, with, with a greater quality, probably a, a, um, a greater uh, technical uh, spin on it to make the viewing experience uh, so, much, uh, so much better. And I think we'll see those three things emerge. So I do think there's a- Sorry, sorry, case. Jeremy, sorry, yeah. sorry. I, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand. You've got big global productions, Crown, you know, Crown, et cetera, it goes global, locally tailored, product and then sky stuff in the middle is what is it, it's not local nor global i'm not i'm not exactly well, it'll, it, it'll, it could be a, it'll be a mix much of it will be local but you could take let's take something like uh, a sport uh, and if you think of you know what we what sky would do to a particular sport relative to what you'd find either a let's say a local free to air a broadcast to be able to do or indeed, a global uh, business would 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 seek to do. Uh, very, 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 very different. I think you could take um, um, some of our local uh, originals. You know where we are seeking to make them bigger, um, better, uh, greater investments, uh, stronger talent in them, uh, and and I think that is a space that that local producers will continue to play in quite different because we're being driven by a subscription business, a subscription model, rather than a free-to-air advertising model uh, or something which I want to have go across you know, every country in the world. So I think there is quite a big space for businesses like Sky to play there. And I think we're starting to see that emerge and that's what we're pursuing. And just one final question, Jeremy, which is about content inequality. The, the, some people call about information inequality, some people talk about entertainment inequality. You talked about the reach of Sky to Sky's customers, but there's a good third, 40% of the UK that don't get the access to the kind of quality of content that Sky has. How much do you worry about that, a kind of two-tier UK in terms of what it consumes on the screen? Yeah, look, we, we want to make it... Uh easy for customers to, 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 to access Sky's content. And we do that in a variety of different ways. If you take a service like uh, Now TV, which is our streaming service, or even Sky uh, uh, today, you know, we have, we've made it progressively easier and easier for customers to access it and cheaper and cheaper to access it in terms of what they have to commit to or to pay. So you can get Sky today without a contract. Uh, you can buy sports, you know, on a daily basis, on a, on a monthly basis or on a yearly basis. Yeah. When I joined, 93% of Sky's base had to take what we called the big bundle. That was everything. Mm -hmm. So pretty much everybody had to take everything. And that was a big barrier. Today, that's, that's you know, much, much smaller as a, as a percentage. The difficult threshold you've got to get across is if you say, well, actually, I don't want people to access that content. People shouldn't have to pay anything. Right. That is that that's that's that is very tough because it just makes investment uneconomic, um, which is why we have so much state you know, subsidy in free -wear services across Europe, because it has to come from somewhere. So I think, you know, in the future world, uh, making it less less commitment, more transactional, lower, lower price is the way to make it more accessible to um, to, to people. But I think paid for content is ultimately the way that you create uh, the revenues that allow the investment in that differentiation, allow that investment in local culture and allow vibrant local players to sit alongside, you know, the big you know, global media players, uh, but also, you know, the free to air broadcasters or the public service broadcasters who are essentially giving their content away from free. Yeah. So I think you can think of it that way. And then the second way you can think of it is, is through through windowing. Mm -hmm. So actually, we might show something on Sky uh, in the first window, right? 
but we'll distribute it elsewhere in later windows. So you can't get it necessarily on the day it's first broadcast, but you can get it uh, 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 downstream. And of course, with broadband networks, with on-demand, with IP networks, that's becoming easier and easier um, because we no longer have to just just relate uh, just rely on linear broadcast uh, all the time to get our content to customers. Jeremy, thank you. I can see by by the way, if we were on air now, there would be someone in the gallery screaming in my ear, saying you're two minutes over, and uh, and there's another show waiting to start. So forgive me for uh, eating into your morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I just wanted to say, Jeremy, that sometimes you hear things and you talk about them as describing sky, but actually, I come away from this morning thinking, well, I, I, actually, they they're, they're good for all of us. I, I I think about this choice between being a drag weight and a rocket ship. I think about that kind of simple mantra of what are you doing more for young people, more for the environment, and more uh, together. And I really will come away thinking about how we all deliver best when we really commit. And so, thank you for talking about Sky, but also talking a little bit about how you know big decisions get made in really big and influential businesses. It's been fascinating to listen to you. Uh, we can't give you a round of applause, uh, but we can uh, wave you off into your day with a smile. So Jeremy Darrett, thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, James. Thanks, everybody.